words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Last night we had such a lovely Advent dinner. When you came into the parish hall, the, the overhead lights were out, but we were had beautiful Christmas tree lights and decorations both on the ceiling and on the tables. You know, the food was really excellent. And it was so nice to be served by volunteers who actually brought the food to our tables. It was just a lovely event. And I'm thankful for everyone who worked so hard to make this dinner special. I left out the fact that the dessert was really good, too. (laughs) So I always think about our Advent event, our Advent dinner. It, It started as a way to thank the people of this congregation for all that they had done during this past year. So it's meant to be thankful. But it's also a time to enjoy each other's company. And for me, there was a special mood that was in that place last night, a, a feeling of community. And I think that is it is a time for our church family to come together, just in the same way that you might join with your family or friends at Christmas time. Now, the Advent dinner didn't just happen. It took a lot of work by a lot of people. So, for example, people went out and bought food, and they brought it to church early in the week, and and people came on Thursday to decorate the room to make it special for us. And, And the cooks were working several days this past week to prepare that wonderful food that we had. And, and you know, the planning for the event didn't just start yesterday. It, it's been going on for a few weeks, maybe months even, where a group of people, a committee got together and they decided what the menu was going to be, identified people that were going to help, kind of divided all the responsibilities, and they thought about each and every step so that it would be meaningful to us who attended. So it took a lot of organization and preparation. And that word preparation is kind of on my mind today. So I'd ask you this question, how have you prepared for this Christmas season in your life? Have you completed all your Christmas cards and sent them away, for example? Have you identified the gifts that you're going to give to people that are special in your life? Perhaps you've thought about where you're going to be on that Christmas time. You've plan maybe a trip to go visit someone special, or maybe if somebody's coming to visit you, you've thought about how you're going to deep clean your house to make it look really good. (laughs) Or maybe you've decorated your house. Another thing that we do in preparation for Christmas. There's a race car driver whose name is Bobby Unter, and he spoke about the importance of preparation. He said that success is where preparation and opportunity meet. He's trying to make the point that preparation is an important part. It happens, it's important in our secular lives, but I'm going to suggest to you today, it's also important in our spiritual life. So I want to focus a little bit today on that word, prepare. It was found in the gospel for today, and we actually sang about it today in the very first song that we sang, the hymn that we sang. But in the, in the gospel, there's a quote that comes from the book of Isaiah, and it says that John the Baptist was the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, and that he said, prepare the way of the Lord, make his way straight. And so just as those wonderful people did all of that work to prepare a lovely Advent dinner for us, and just as you may have prepared for what you're going to do this Christmas season, I believe that today we're encouraged to think about how we are preparing our spiritual life for the coming of Jesus, our Savior. Now, let's think about all the times in Scripture that we can hear the words about preparation and how important it is for us to be prepared. I start with Noah. Noah, the one who prepared for the flood, right? He built an ark. He went out and got food. He gathered animals and human beings to get on the ark with him. All the time, probably the people that were around him were laughing at him. He prepared. Or Joseph, who prepared for the drought that was going to happen in Egypt by putting away grain and food for the people of Egypt. But it's not just in the work that they did. It's also in words that are shared with us in in Scripture. I just want to choose this passage from Ecclesiasticus, 
which says, those who fear the Lord prepare their hearts and humble themselves before him. Now we often, I often think about when we hear the word fear in scripture, we should use the word maybe instead respect or, or trust in God perhaps. And so if we respect the Lord, then we should prepare for his coming. And there's many passages in the New Testament as well that help us with that. I think about the story about a rich man. It's a parable that you can find. And it talks about the fact that this rich man decided that he was going to build these large barns and put away all of his goods into these barns so he could save them for another time. But it turns out that when he finished building those barns and before he had taken anything out of them, God decided it was his time to go. And he did. And then the parable continues, God speaking and saying, what will happen with all of those earthly things that you have prepared for yourself? That's how he spoke to the man. And I think the meaning of that particular parable is to remind us that while we may need to prepare for earthly things, we really should focus on preparing for heavenly things as well. And there's another story that I like, another parable, the parable of the ten bridesmaids. You probably know it. There were five foolish and five wise bridesmaids. And the five wise ones were the ones that decided that they were going to have extra oil. They were going to be prepared. And they were. So when the groom finally came, the wise ones had plenty of oil and the foolish ones did not. And only the wise ones were invited into that celebration. And Jesus explained as he was doing that, that the meaning of that story is that we are to keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Another way of saying that we should be prepared. I believe that God wants us to be physically, mentally, and spiritually prepared for his coming. So here we are, already kind of pretty far into into Advent, already, already closer to Christmas. 17 more days is all we've got. And so I'd ask you to think about how you are going to prepare yourself for the coming of Jesus. How might your heart and your mind and soul be ready for his coming into your life? Now we have a clue for us, maybe, in the gospel. For lots and lots of people, they say, went out to visit John the Baptist in the desert. That's where they went. And the desert has always been considered a place of solitude, a place for quiet and reflection. And so I'd ask you to think about setting aside a little bit of time between now and Christmas Day, where you can find a little bit of quiet and reflection, And in that time, there's so much that you might do. Perhaps you might offer a prayer to Jesus that he will help you to be ready for his coming. Perhaps you might just quiet your mind and soul and see if God speaks to you through your heart. And there's other things that you might do as you prepare for Christmas from a spiritual perspective. You might choose to meditate on a daily meditation for the season of Advent. You might read scripture. Or you might do some things. You might choose to give something to a needy family. You might choose to pray for someone that you know that's sick or suffering. Or you might actually go visit someone who cannot leave their house. Many ways to prepare. Now, the wonderful, One of the wonderful things I believe about God is that God meets us where we are. And I think about this word that I use, prepare, and the fact that we were encouraged to prepare. And yet you can find lots of times in Scripture where we're told that God prepared for us as well. And so I think about the fact that God prepared this beautiful earth that we get to live in as a place for us to be. And Psalm 65 talked about that very specifically. For Psalm 65 says that God visited the earth and watered it. God greatly enriched it. And God provided the people with grain. That's how God prepared the earth for us. And I love those words that come to us from Psalm 23 that also talk about preparation. A particular verse says, God prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And I think about that as meaning that God helps us to be ready for whatever we're going to experience in life, preparing us, nurturing us. And I especially like the time in the Gospel of John where Jesus said to his followers, I go before you to prepare a place for you. 
Just as we are asked to be prepared, God is preparing for us as well. Now in Advent, our preparation is for the coming of Jesus, the birth of Jesus at Christmas time. And so we prepare to recreate that night when Jesus was born in Bethlehem and the shepherds came to visit him. And as part of that, we prepare to celebrate the fact that God came to earth to be to live among us. And there's another theme that we find in the Advent season that has to do with preparing for the second coming of Jesus. And I kind of look at that two different ways. For sure, it's talking about the second coming of Jesus that's going to happen at the end of the world when he's going to judge the world. But for me, I kind of feel it's also a coming that might happen to each and every one of us individually when we are called to go visit Jesus when we die. And so as we think about that second coming or the first coming of Jesus, whichever one is important to us, we once again turn to the words of John the Baptist who came, who said to everyone who came to the desert, he said, repent. And so as we hear those words, we remember that we all have a sinful nature. We repent of those things that we have sinned in the past, and we commit ourselves once more to follow Jesus. We prepare for Jesus coming with repentance. And as part of that, that we read in today's gospel, John turned to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and he said to them a couple of things, but the one I like to hear is he said, bear fruit worthy of repentance. And those words have kind of stuck with me this week. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Now, I've often thought about repentance as a time when we kind of cut back or we get rid of or we limit what we have. So we want to make sure that we get rid of the parts of ourselves that are unworthy of God. But in this phrase... John the Baptist is telling us that repentance is a time of growth, not a time of getting rid of. Now, in my particular study Bible, it says that bearing fruit, bearing the fruit that is worthy of repentance is described as the beginning of a new relationship with God. And then, if you study scripture in the Old Testament, it usually thought that bearing fruit was thought of as doing good works that took away God's punishment for our sins, and I'm sure that all of us can do that. But I hope today that you think of bearing fruit worthy of repentance and that your repentance that you do is more like a tree growing and producing fruit or a flowering of a bush. And so we grow by experiencing God as the center of our life. We grow when we join with other Christians in a community that seeks to share God's love with one another. And we grow by turning away from sin and turning to God. And I think that this idea of bearing fruit worthy of repentance is spoken of so clearly in the letter to the Galatians. Because first it says that we have to get rid of the things that aren't good for us, the sins of our flesh, which include enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, envy, and quarrels. Wow, I think I could fit into any one of those categories at different points in time in my life. We're asked to get rid of those things, to repent from those things. And instead, we are called to bear the fruits of the Spirit. And those fruits are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Oh boy, I wish for self-control sometimes. <laughs> but aren't those beautiful things for us to repent for, repent to? By the way, the next verse in Galatians says, and none of those things, there's no law against any of those things. What, a, what an interesting thing for Scripture to tell us. And so we seek to bear the fruits worthy of repentance. And I wonder if there's any of those that I mentioned that specifically speak to you. So perhaps you might seek the fruit of peace. And peace is the theme that we used in today as we lit the second candle for Advent. And peace is something that I pray for and wish for all of the time because I want peace in my heart, a peace that knows that God is with me and I'm with God. I want a peace that only God can give me. And I know that if I can find the peace of God that I will be freed up from things that I shouldn't do and do things that I want to do. 
And I actually want the piece that's described in the psalm that we sang for today, which says that in God's time there shall be an abundance of peace till the moon shall shine no more. What a beautiful thought for us to have. Or perhaps today you might wish to bear the fruit of hope. In the reading from Romans, we're encouraged to be steadfast in faith and to be listened to Scripture. It actually says encouraged by Scripture. So that we will hope, we will have hope for the coming of Jesus, a way to prepare. Or you might wish to bear the fruit of joy in your repentance. For as we prepare, we can look forward to the joy that we will experience when we see Jesus. And the last verse that's written in Romans for today kind of brings all of this together for us, where it says, May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. (coughs) May this Advent be a time for you of growth, a time for you to prepare, a time for you to repent. Let us all join together and look forward as we to bearing the fruits worthy of repentance, most especially those fruits of joy and peace and hope. Amen.